Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder as I step out for a walk and deliver an episode to you while I stroll around. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good morning, listeners. It's a lovely day here in suburban Chicago, and I'm out for a stroll. I say lovely day. The temperature is nice. It is mid-70s and humid, but it is overcast. The clouds are like right on the edge of that temperature where it looks like maybe it's going to rain, but it's not. Uh, The the news says it's not, but or the um, weather forecast says it's not, but uh, it could. It sure looks like it's going to rain at any moment. So we'll see what we see. Well, it's been a little while since I talked about some new games I played, and I do have some new games logged. So I thought I would take a moment to uh, tell you about some new games. The three games that I want to talk about today, uh, I had a chance to play these over the last couple of weeks with some friends, and one of them is on Board Game Arena, so I've started playing it on Board Game Arena as well. I'd be happy to uh, talk to you there about it if you're so inclined. So the first game is called Tipperary. This is from designer Gunther Burkhart, Gunther Burkhart artists Ari Oliver and Clemens Franz, and it's published by Lookout Games. Uh, Tipperary is a game from uh, a year or two ago. I picked it up on my birthday actually we ended up stopping at a game store and i was like well i haven't gotten a new game in a while so i'll get a game um and it looked pretty neat one of the things i liked about it is it's from the lookout thread of family weight games which meant it had a pretty good possibility of being a game it would be fun to play with my in-laws or with visiting grandmothers or you know it's a good filler game something we can get out in a variety of places it is a tile laying game uh, and it's got a couple things that are pretty interesting about it. The, the premise is you are sort of building out a village in County Tipperary in Ireland. And basically you're just trying to get points by raising sheep. And then there's a couple other sort of things that you can do to accumulate points. The gimmick, which I think is pretty neat, is that there's a pentagram shaped device in the middle. It's a, it's a board piece and it divides up into five spaces. And in each space you're going to put two tiles. Then on top of that, there is like a spinner with five different coats of arms and the coats of arms match the five different village starting spaces that you can take, which is like a little board around which you're going to lay your tiles. Then uh, turn after turn, each turn somebody takes a turn spinning the spinner and whichever zone around the of the five things your coat of arms ends up pointing at, you take those two tiles and you pick one to put into your village. It works pretty well as a mechanism, it's pretty neat. You put the other one back and then add a new one. The only thing I don't like is occasionally you will, it will spin to the same zone you were just in. And we added a house rule, because generally that means one of the two tiles in the zone you were just in, you already rejected it. So you might have wanted it, but most of the time it was not fun rather than fun to get the same zone again. So we added a house rule that if you spin it and it lands in the same zone, we rotate it one notch clockwise so that you have a different selection. I mean, if you sort of start with that rule and everybody understands it, great. So what you do is you're taking the tiles and then the tiles have a variety of different landscape features written on them. Among the landscape features are sheep, ruins, bogs, there are open pastures, grain fields, and there are granaries. And basically what the game has is it's got a variety of different mechanisms by which you build up points. You're sort of competing for the biggest herd of sheep, so you kind of keep all the sheep together. Some of the tiles will give you an extra sheep, a wooden sheep, that you put on one of the empty pastures, which could then connect two flocks of sheep to make a bigger flock of sheep. The granaries allow you to move your whiskey barrel forward on this other track, and you get points and more sheep for moving forward on this whisk on this whiskey track. You also have the bogs, and the bogs give you these single tiles that you can use to sort of fill in holes in your board because one of the things is all these tiles are really weirdly shaped. There's no, it's not a simple sort of set of Tetris pieces. The tiles vary in in amount of space that they take up from like three or four squares to like maybe six or seven, and they are really weird shapes. So it's hard to get them to fit together evenly so that you don't have gaps, particularly if you're trying to do the other scoring things that the game asks you to. So these little one, one pieces that you can slot into those gaps are really useful. And then there are these ruins, and if you get three ruins in a row, you get a little tower, and at the end of the game, you can slot the tower into one of those gaps as well. And then at the end of the game, you score points for, have it for your biggest sheep herd. You get a 
five extra points if you have the biggest sheep herd of anybody on the table. You get points for little stone circles. I didn't even mention those, but those have points on them. You get points for your whiskey barrel. And then you also get points for your largest complete rectangle in, the, in your village. So you sort of find the area where you have the biggest rectangle of completed squares. And you get one point for every square in that space. And you get uh, a few extra points, I think eight or something, if you completely surrounded your village. Instead of sort of working off in one direction, you worked around the village. You get points for that too. So there's like a whole bunch of different ways you can earn points and it's the mix of these things that results in you getting your score. That was more detailed than I intended to be, but uh, it felt like just to explain what's going on was necessary. Tipperary was pretty fun. Uh, I thought it was a relatively easy learn, even though there are a variety of different things. None of them is very complicated. I like the mix of different ways to score points, but also some of the different pressures that arise then as you try to figure out what is the best balance you want to take in order to score the points you want. It works really well and I think it makes for an interesting gameplay. So if you get a chance to play Tipperary, I recommend. That's Tipperary by Gunther Bernhardt. Uh, next up, we have Voidfall. Uh, Voidfall is a big old table hog of a game in which you have a number of different uh, factions competing for control of the galaxy. It has a sort of 4X vibe. It might be actually a 4X game, I don't know. And the, the theme is there's all of these established houses, is the, the term the game uses for like large spacefaring civilizations. And a civilization from another dimension, the void, opens up and all of these malevolent beings sort of swarm in and infect everything. As a group, the houses join together and are unable to close the, the gate to the other dimension but there are still plenty of void creatures infesting the galaxy. And so basically what you're doing is you're trying to expand, exploit, explore, and the other X exterminate with your faction, earning reputation points, which is the victory condition, you know, at the end, the, that's how we value victory. But at the same time, there are also this sort of unified enemy, the void, whom you can fight. So there's uh, plenty of sort of combat or conquest that doesn't involve going against other players. The game does allow for you to go against other players, but it does, doesn't seem to be the focus of the game. Seems like something you can do, but probably not something you're going to do a ton. Uh, the game was designed by Nigel Buckle and David Turksey. David Turksey is somebody I really like, although I found some of his output a little uneven. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned that at the game, and the people I was playing with were like, what do you mean? Which games? And I Struggled to think, um, but I would say like Redacted was his first game. It's a little uneven. Um, Dice Settlers I liked, but the groups I've played it with haven't been super enamored of it. Uh, he also helped design uh, Welcome to Dino World and Roman Roll. Um, I haven't played Roman Roll yet, but Welcome to Dino World a lot of people found a little befuddling. That said, I do like a lot of his games as well. I really like Anachrony. I like his solo bot for Cerebria. Um, I think he's a, gr a great designer and I'm excited to try games when they come up, but he's not an auto play for me. Like I have to kind of investigate which games are gonna be a good fit, but this really did look neat. I did not get this because I knew at least one friend was getting it also. And I'm trying to be a little more conservative in how I'm spending my game buying money. And this was a big beast of a game. It is the first Mind Clash game I didn't buy for myself. And I wish I had a little bit. I'm super jealous of, the, of having the game. But I'm never going to play it without one of these folks and or like if I had it, somehow I had a game, they couldn't make it, but I really want to play it. I'm sure they would loan it to me. So, you know, I have access to this game. I didn't need my own copy, but the uh, collector in me really covets the game. It's beautiful. It's huge. Tons of pieces. The uh, collector's edition, which we got to play, comes with these triple layer boards, which have uh, insets and then... Like the base game comes with uh, cardstock player mats, and if you have the double layer boards, the player mats slide into the double layer board. So uh, that's a really neat choice uh, in terms of gameplay construction. The graphic design is by Ian O'Toole, and it feels like it. You can kind of you can see a consistency of the symbols that makes it easy to read the game. 
so I haven't really explained what the game is. Like I said, it's a 4X game, your conquest. The gameplay mechanism is, is a hand management thing. You have a set of action cards that you can play, and on a turn you're going to play one of them, and then you do the thing that action says. There's a lot of different kinds of resources in managing how they flow. Uh, there's corruption you have to manage, and you're going to do like five of those different uh, research cards, uh, and then the round will end, and there's some end round stuff, the void attack and all of that, and then you do another round, and there's, I think you play three rounds. So you have like 15 turns, give or take. Um, I don't remember exactly how many cards you play, but that's sort of how it works. But a turn is a pretty elaborate deal. In a four-player game, you're easily sitting eight to ten minutes between turns. But it doesn't feel like unpleasant downtime to me because you have so much time. You have so much to think about. You have a lot of planning to do. I did find in sort of like the third age, by the second card play of the five, I had figured out everything I was planning to, have, to do for the round. And then it felt like I was just, uh, it was a little bit more downtime. But like I said, there's a lot going on in the game, so really fun. There's great technology trees. You can advance technologies and get these uh, bonuses for yourself. Um, the combat is entirely deterministic, which is nice. So you can figure out before you go in how you're going to do in the combat. You can also figure out what's going to happen during the invasion phase. So it's very mechanical and Euro that way. I really like that. Voidfall is just, uh, it's a beast of a game, but really cool, and definitely a game I'd like to play again. Definitely a game I really enjoyed. So, if you get a chance to try out Voidfall from Nigel Buckle and David Turksey, I definitely recommend. Ian O'Toole is the designer, Mind Clash Games is the publisher. All right, the third game I got to try is Pax Pamir 2nd Edition. Now, this one falls into the category of games I generally am not super keen to try, but it turns out that it's a good fit for me. And these are sort of historical war games. I've mentioned on the show before my hesitance or my dislike about this process. You know, Pax Pamir is an interesting case because part of what's going on in the game is talking a little bit about the way that the British and the Russians were kind of struggling over the area of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan had very little self-control or self-determination over the area. Uh, and in the game, you represent kind of nebulous forces or uh, persons in power in Afghanistan, but in the co trying to gain the most influence in the context of these larger questions, or these larger power forces. So in the game, you are allied with one of the three factions, either the Brits, the Russians, or the... And you don't represent anyone particular in the game, but instead you represent people competing for power or control in the context of the uh, struggle, the great game, as the British and the Russians sort of so arrogantly called it. So the idea of the game is there are these three factions, right? There's the British, the Afghans, and the Russians, and you represent power brokers sort of mixing back and forth. You are allied with one or another, and there are occasionally dominance cards that come into play to check, and if you are allied with the power that's in domination, then you look at who has the most influence with them and that person scores points. Uh, it turns out so far it's a game I'm not very good at. I'm doing pretty badly. I did pretty badly in the one game we played on the table and I've done pretty badly in the three games that I've played on Board Game Arena. So I'm not, I haven't been super successful yet with the uh, experience of the game, but it generally it looks like something I should enjoy and should be good at. Um, it resonates a lot kind of halfway between sort of card-driven games like Twilight Struggle or The Expanse board game is a card game I've played, a card-driven game I've played, or 1960, The Making of a President. So it resonates with that, uh, but then it also feels a lot like the other game that I've played with the name Pax at the beginning, and that's Pax Renaissance. Now that game has the card-driven thing you're buying from a market, and I believe that buying from the market and having to pay for those is part of the Pax idea. If you're saying that, that's kind of once one of the things you're asserting. Uh, but then it's also got this element of putting cards in your tableau, and the cards in your tableau have powers on them, and you can use the powers on them to, to do your turn. But also the idea that you are not part of the nation states, but rather your individual power brokers. That is something that's also happening in Pax Renaissance. Now in Pax Renaissance, you get to pick from a variety of different win conditions. In Pax Pamir, there are only two 
There are two ways to score points, and there's only one way to win. Uh, you score points either by being allied with the dominant faction when there's a dominance check, and then gaining points from being the most influential with them. Or the second thing would be if there is no clear dominant faction during a dominance check, then being the person who has the most influence on the board generally. Uh, and those are two slightly different ways of measuring things, which makes for an interesting balance because you could put a lot of energy into having influence, and then if the faction you're allied with isn't dominant, you get nothing. Uh, and then the scores you know, are relatively low, but the idea is if at any point anybody is four full points ahead of all the other players, so ahead of the second place person, then the game is instantly over and they win. Otherwise you play out until four dominance cards have come out and after the fourth dominance card, whoever has the most points wins and if there's a tie, whoever has the most military strength wins. So the win condition is relatively straightforward, but how you get there is pretty complex. I'm not gonna go into the full explanation of the game. If you're interested in it, you can look it up uh, from somebody who's gonna do a more f thorough review. But I will say it's a really interesting take on the PAX system, uh, fascinating dynamic between the different elements. Of course, it requires a stern uh, sense of how games interact and how players interact because it is all cutthroat going after each other. Like, it turns out I don't mind, I mean, I've mentioned before, I don't mind that kind of game when I know it's coming and when that's the key part of the game. Like, when what you're doing in the game is going after each other the whole time, I don't generally mind that. I just like to know, have clarity of purpose about what, you, what you're doing there. So from that perspective, uh, it's pretty interesting. I will say the, the mechanisms are still a little opaque to me, and I had some significant issues with the with our first interpretation of the rules. So we played our in-person game pretty substantially incorrect. It was still fun, but really off from the way the rules are supposed to work. So I'm, like I said, I'm in my, I think, simultaneously second and third game of PAX Premier online right now. And so I'm just kind of getting my feet wet in playing it. But so far, I think it's pretty interesting. And uh, if it's a thing you'd like to play with me, send me an invite on Board Game Arena. I'd be happy to play it with you. Oh, my son and I dusted off Hellboy recently. Uh, Hellboy is a delightful Ameritrash style fight em up game in which you are one of the members of the Bureau for Paranormic, Paranormal Research and Development, the BPRD, and you and your friends are going to investigate some sort of supernatural horror. We had a lot of fun just uh, romping around, fighting baddies. The uh, Hellboy system is really neat. It's got different kinds of skills and you have different levels of dice that you use in those skills and the level of the dice you use determines um, how likely you are to succeed and what's going to happen to you. It's a really smooth system that works pretty well and once you kind of understand the game uh, it runs pretty quick. I mean we played in 80 or 90 minutes and we played a, one of the medium length scenarios or the shorter scenarios one of the two. But it's good to get that out again and it makes me want to get back to playing it and painting it, which I, I painted a bunch of the lizards and a bunch of the Nazis, but I haven't painted nearly, I don't even think, think I, I don't even think I've played half of the figures altogether. So there's a lot to uh, unpack there. Yeah. So if you get a chance to play Hellboy the board game, I recommend. Well, that is just about it for me today. I hope that you have enjoyed walking with me. I'd like to know what you've been playing. Head over to Board Game Geek Guild 3269 and share your thoughts there. I am going to try to start posting there more about the podcast. Maybe each week I'll do a week in review post, sort of reminding everybody what what we've po what I posted this week. Just because I'd like to see a little bit more action on the guild. And I think when people post there, then other people see it and we go from there. So I'll try to remember to do that. Uh, if not, you can always send me a geek mail message. Wombat929 is my username. Or you can send me an email, brendan at Rattlebox Game. Well, thanks for joining me in my walk today. I hope your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games.